Hello, Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of the Micro Moment. Today, we are joined by a special guest, Dr. Julia Suavola, to talk about her company, Cirillo. She got her PhD from John Hopkins University, studying microfluidics and coital engineering drug delivery particles that mimic viruses. From there, she did her postdoc at University of California, San Francisco, focusing on cystic fibrosis drug discovery. She's been in the biotech industry for five years now and is currently at Cirillo as the head of product. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So, Julia, what got you interested in science in the first place? How did you get into engineering? I've really always been pretty into science. I think even when I was in elementary school, my mom had me in these little science in the summer camps. I loved. I was a little nerd back then. <laughs> <laughs> totally different from now. Um, I also had this really huge rock collection. I loved any rocks with mica. I thought mica was like the coolest thing. They all have mica. Um, I spent summers collecting lightning bugs, seeing if they all flashed with same or different patterns. And I bring up these examples because I really, I see science and engineering and what I'm doing now really is just a natural extension of the things that I've always liked doing since I was a little kid. So for a long time, setting up and running science experiments was my job. It was awesome. Um, and now I work on products that support scientists, many of whom are doing their own environmental sampling. And even, <laughs> even my rock collection uh, came back around. I thought Michael was like so cool because it was shiny and flat. And then in grad school, I actually learned that it's molecularly flat and super important for a bunch of surface force measurements. And I have some friends who worked with mica. So it's, just, it's really cool. I've always loved it. And, you know, now I'm still a scientist and kind of just an extension of the things I was into since elementary school, just different questions, new tools, and hopefully armed with a little bit more background knowledge. It sounded like that you had a harder time figuring out specifically what science field you were going to start out with, because it sounded like you were dabbling a little bit of everything as a kid. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I loved exploring and learning about the world around me. I think I did always know, though, that I really wanted to be involved in science that was geared towards medical and biological research. I thought that was a really good way to use my interest to help people in a really concrete way. So in that sense, can you tell us a little bit more about your PhD research? Yeah. So my PhD research was, was kind of right at the interface of chemistry, biology, and physics. I was motivated by pulmonary drug delivery, um, in particular for cystic fibrosis. So for my research, I was measuring intermolecular forces between mucus and macromolecules that could potentially be used for pulmonary drug delivery. Uh, a primary barrier to pulmonary drug delivery is the mucosal layer. So for that research, I hypothesized that nature has already made this fantastic system for mucopenetration in the form of viruses. So I studied viruses that do and don't penetrate mucus and then try to engineer particle coatings with similar charges and charge distributions to mucopenetrating viruses. I then measured the macromolecular interactions between a mucus layer and the particle coatings, and then used microfluidic devices to test whether those particles would actually pass through mucus. The goal overall was basically to make particles that mimicked viruses that could penetrate the mucus in order to get a drug through that mucosal layer and into lung cells. That's really cool because, yeah, as you said, the mucus layer is thick and, you know, in humans it helps create a barrier, especially for bacteria or other microbes in our gut from getting into the intestines. And especially with cystic cystic fibrosis, the mucus layer is a lot thicker, right? Because it can't get rid of the mucus as easily. Oh, yeah. How much time do I have to talk about mucus? 
<laughs> it's it's thicker. It's also um, it's a lot more viscous, and then it's this po- it creates this positive feedback loop. That, so and then also because it's thicker, it mashes down the cilia that are supposed to push the mucus and have it pass through um, your gut or your lungs, and it creates this positive feedback loop where it's thicker, and so then your body is less able to get like neutrophils to the microbes that are forming microbiomes within that mucosal layer. And they do this thing where they just explode their insides out and they dump their DNA into the mucus layer and kind of trying to make the mucus layer itself less habitable for the microbiome. And what it does is the DNA then further increases the viscosity of mucus and it just makes it Worse. So for cystic fibrosis, it's a really difficult system and it's really tenacious. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a vicious uh, cycle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's also really cool. It sounds like, you know, you're using nature's evolution to help drug delivery in this instance. Yeah. Yeah. So there are one core difference that exists between viruses that are mucopenetrating and not mucopenetrating is whether they're envelope viruses. So for example, COVID is um, that's caused by an envelope virus. And an envelope virus is coated with a lipid bilayer versus a capsid virus that's proteinaceous. And capsid viruses are much more effective at penetrating a mucosal layer. And what we kind of found at the end of the day was that's probably because of the size scale of separation between these coexisting positive and negative charges. I know I'm not in my head right now. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. That's a little past my uh, expertise. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, so nature has found a way to penetrate this mucus barrier that is difficult to penetrate. And so then by mimicking those viruses and really using proteins to coat particles, we were able to then engineer particles that could effectively pass through mucus. I think in the end, we had we used proteins and we used PEG, and they both worked really well. Oh, cool. So, like, I do know DNA is negatively charged mm-hmm. as well. So, I, I didn't realize that there are proteins that are negatively charged as well. Yeah, they have a coexistence of charge. They have positive and negative charges. And it's really, so BSA was one that I used um, a lot. And BSA has a net negative charge. And so then actually my negative control was concannabinol A, and that's positively charged. So it's, they, you know, they exist in multiple forms, multiple charges. So could you tell us a little bit more about your experiences in the scientific field? Was the science in your postdoctoral position different than your PhD? And how they relate to all of microbiology? So, yes, my postdoc was totally different. It had the same core motivation as my PhD um, in that it was still looking for ways to, within the postdoc, I was still looking for ways to treat lung diseases and in particular, again, cystic fibrosis. Um, But within my postdoc, I was actually trying to develop a method for using an individual's own cells for high throughput drug screening in order to find a treatment for that was for an individual and their own unique cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis has many, many different genotypes that uh, create a cystic fibrosis phenotype, lead to a cystic fibrosis phenotype. And so using the individual cells is really important because the response to treatment can depend on the person's genotype. That was still actually not related to microbiology or microbiome at all. I actually didn't do any move into microbiology leaning work until my first industry job. So within that job, I was um, helping to develop an instrument to automate and multiplex CRISPR-based genetic editing in yeast and E. coli. That's really cool. So I guess going back to individual therapy, did did that involve taking a biopsy 
from someone and growing up their cells in a lab to see how they would react to different treatments? Yeah, we would get um, cells from either nasal scrapings of individual cystic fibrosis. I think they're actually really, you know, kind of akin to this uh, COVID test where you have to, it's pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> but so we would take some scrapings or um, every now and then we would have individuals that would have some trachea excised and we could harvest cells from excised trachea. What made you want to get into industry versus academia? Okay. So there are a couple different reasons uh, that I had for moving into industry. I think there was this pivotal moment while I was doing my postdoc. I was at a cystic fibrosis conference. It was a wonderful conference. I was so lucky to be invited. And at that conference, there were huge figures in the field who they'd been doing cystic fibrosis work for decades, had made some incredible breakthroughs. I got to meet some of those people. And I kind of was looking at them and thinking about my work, thinking about my PhD work, thinking about my postdoc work, and realized that I had no idea if my work would ever actually make any material difference within the field, which I kind of thought about that really hard for a little bit, kind of bummed, but it's just, you know, percolating. And I decided that I could probably make a greater impact on the scientific and medical community and I thought I could be more sure to make an impact on the community by making tools that help other scientists and could be used for a much wider set of problems. And so there I decided to move into the biotech industry. So I still get to work on really, really cool science. It's just from a different angle. I do like that thought. It's like, I want to help elevate other scientists to help better the research that's out there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know what? I, I'm kind of, I'm a little postdoc over here doing my thing, but I could really just help you guys. If I help you guys get the tools that you need, I just know you'll be so effective with them. So I did that. I have to say it's a really unique answer. I really like that answer. It's really cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I'd like to pivot to your current role. You're now at Cirillo. Could you tell us about the company? and your role within it? Yeah, sure. So Cirillo is a tech bio startup company, and we're making tools for microbiome research. Our flagship product is a portable plate reader that can sit and take microbial growth readings in almost any environment. And then from there, we're continually building out our platform for microbiome research. At Cirillo, I'm the head of product, so I'm responsible for talking to scientists, identifying tools that will be useful to their research, helping our engineering team design and launch those tools. And then I get to go back to the scientists who started the cycle, talk to them again, and make sure that our tools are working for them as we all envisioned and that our technology is as helpful as possible within their workflows. I think you kind of alluded to this before, but what is Cirillo's mission? Uh, so Cirillo's mission is really to democratize research by making tools that make research easier, faster, more accessible, and of course, cheaper. So it's completely in line with my goals as a scientist, helping researchers to efficiently address a really wide variety of biological problems. So I know a lot of Cirillo's products can be translated to specifically microbiome research. Was it hard to transition to microbiome research? Yeah, it's been a challenge, but it's been a really fun one. Uh, microbiome research, it's vast, it's really complex, and I'll admit, kind of coming into this role without a lot of experience with it, a bit daunting. but. It's, you know, and it's definitely different from other things that I've worked on and I'm still learning. Uh, but I've been really fortunate because I've worked on a really wide range of research. I don't know if you can tell, I'm kind of used to whatever role I go into. I'm kind of doing something completely different. So I'm used to it. And at this point, I've used a lot of different tools and techniques. So there's definitely some overlap. And it helps. It's an area that I've been interested in for a while. I kind of, I never really leapt into it because it was kind of daunting to me. So 
I was really, really excited to have the opportunity and I'm really loving the challenge so far. And what was the most surprising thing you learned about the microbiome? So I recently learned that yeast have their own microbiomes. Wait, really? I went to a talk at ASM and that's what somebody said. Wow. I actually never realized that either. I hope it's true because <laughs> it's maybe the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if it is true, it's, that's just like, you know, now you have microbiomes that exist on microbes that then exist within our gut microbiome. And that's just wild. And, you know, it's been really enlightening to learn just how big microbiome as a concept is. I mean, it's everywhere. Urinary tract, soil, coral reef, yeast. It's just everywhere. So it's been, it's cool. It's kind of a nesting doll situation there. Right? Yeah. One of the craziest things for me was learning that microbes have their own kind of immune system. That's where we got CRISPR from, was finding out that bacteria have the system to break down viral DNA or RNA if they're infected with it. Yeah, that's really cool. And then also kind of on top of that, I, I learned this at the job where I was working on CRISPR. We were trying to figure out how to better select for E. coli that had actually been transformed. And one idea that was floated was using microbes that actively attack other microbes. I was like, wait, you guys fight each other? Like, I just thought so bad. <laughs> so yeah, like you say, they, they have their own immune system. They have their own competitive environments and you know, competitive uh, consortia that they live in. And yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> You never think about the same things happening on the macro scale happen in the micro scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's like a way throwback analogy, but, you know, like in Men in Black where they have the galaxy that's on oh, the yeah. collar of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a galaxy in a galaxy. Like they're just like, I'm like, look at my countertop. There's probably a microbiome and they're doing their own thing, just living. Hopefully, hopefully not, but. <laughs> so in your opinion, what's the biggest barrier for microbiome research and how does Cirillo hope to alleviate this? I think that with the scale and the scope of microbiome, like research and in general, like what we were just talking about, I think the biggest barrier really lies in the tools that are currently available to microbiome researchers. The bulk of the tools that are currently available, a lot of them were designed decades ago and for general biology and chemical purposes, not even specifically for microbes or for the challenges facing microbiome research. And that lack of microbiome-specific tools makes research less efficient and also creates this major issue in terms of data reproducibility across the community. And when you're talking about something that a field that is just this complex, connecting the data is enormously important and also is a huge challenge. You know, it's, it's so important when you have all these different microbes, they exist in complex communities, the environments affect their behavior, presence of one microbial species can affect their behavior. It's just a lot to get your head around. And so I think that empowering scientists, building tools that help them efficiently run experiments in exactly the way that they want to run them, which is Cirillo's goal, could have an enormous impact on helping scientists drive the field forward. So your company has several products out, with your newest being the co-culturing duet system. Can you tell us a little about this product, how it works, and some potential applications? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited about the co-culture system. It's been a lot of fun to work on and to talk to scientists about since the launch. It's designed to help scientists study the impact of growing one cell species in the presence of another cell population by observing and measuring their growth behaviors separately and dynamically. The system consists of 
two reservoirs that are separated by a polycarbonate filter with 0.2 micron diameter pores. The reservoirs have transparent bottoms and they snap into a tray that enables optical density measurements of the individual separated cell suspensions that are still in fluidic contact with each other. So still able to impact the growth of one another. And so you're able to read their optical density, track their growth throughout an experiment. And you can track it on Cirillo's plate reader. And then it's also compatible with almost any standard plate reader. So how does it help with microbiome research and what sets it apart from other similar products on the market? So Cirillo's co-culture system gives scientists access to data that they can't otherwise get without engineering their own system. So the core offerings that sets it apart from other products is the ability to monitor multiple populations independently and throughout their growth. Other products for co-culturing microbes don't allow for populations to be physically isolated and accessed throughout experimentation, or they're not compatible with plate readers and optical density measurements. So it's really difficult to get quantitative real-time data using other systems. I can, off the top of my head, I can just think of things such as like quorum sensing, uh, testing, let's see, what else? Uh, just the passing of metabolites between a single organism and uh, entire communities, so see how it affects each other. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there are, there are tons of applications. I think you I think you asked that, and I didn't answer that part of your question earlier. <laughs> but yeah, there are tons of applications. Another, when you think of Eurobiome microbes that are, some of them are notoriously slow growing, um, and there are researchers who want to study them in the presence of E. coli, which grows really rapidly. And so ordinarily, the E. coli with other tools would just completely uh, wash out the signal from these Eurobiome microbes. Um, and then we actually have one lab that's done something really cool with them already. Uh, they grew intestinal organoids in one reservoir and salmonella in an adjacent reservoir to look at the impact of how circadian rhythms and timing affect salmonella infection. Wow, really? Yeah, that's probably one of the applications that I, probably one of my favorite ones to talk about. <laughs> If you can't tell, I've had a really, really good time talking to scientists since launching this product. <laughs> yes, I can also see how it, you could use uh, cell cultures a lot in this just to see what metabolites are doing to cell cultures. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, some scientists have come back where they've, they've tried to do that and they don't know if it's the micro, but like if they're, when they're not able to separate the populations. They don't know if it's the microbes themselves, like infiltrating or killing the cells, or if it's metabolites from the microbes. And so, yeah, we're, we're really excited to see uh, what kind of different cell cultures and studies, you know, it was, I think, initially launched with the idea of just microbial populations that, you know, the core product, but we've had so many different cool ideas come across and with mammalian cells too, which is, you know, from my postdoc, that's near and dear to my heart. So how easy is it to use this product? Very easy. It's designed to mimic a traditional microplate format. So if you have used a microplate, you already know how to use this system. The Coke culture duets come already snapped into a frame, ready to go. A scientist can simply load their sample, put the frame into their plate reader, and they're off. And they also, they don't even need to use all the duets. They can snap them out, save them for a next experiment, snap them in, use them. We try to make the system as fast, flexible, user-friendly as possible. Has Cirillo collaborated with other academic labs with your instrument? If so, what kind of research and what did you find? Yeah, we're incredibly fortunate to have some really fantastic academic labs collaborating with us. It's really how we started. Cirillo's first plate reader was originally developed in Jason Papin's lab at the University of Virginia. 
Jason is still Cirillo's chief product officer. He's closely involved in development, um, and his lab actually ran early experiments to validate the co-culture system, studying interactions between pulmonary microbes. Again, also another application near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and then we have another longtime user of Cirillo products at Duke University. They work with us really closely, giving us feedback on all of our products. They've been running experiments with the co-culture system for bugs as drugs studies. And they're super helpful. And then we have several other partnerships. These are the two that I've been chatting with the most right now for you know, the co-culture system in particular. I think they're probably a little sick of me by now. <laughs> I can see the appeal for it in human microbiome research. Are there other fields of research that use this co-culturing duet system, like agricultural, environmental, or veterinary? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're supporting customers for a huge range of applications. And we hope to add applications as we roll out new versions. We have some ideas in mind. We have customers running phage experiments. I just spoke to someone who wants to study toxic algal blooms with the co-culture system. We're working with a very cool organization called Tiny Earth, who's studying bugs with antimicrobial properties isolated from soil samples, and the soil samples are actually collected through an educational program. It's a very cool group. We work with agricultural companies, and we do have a veterinarian. He's exploring the use of the co-culture system to diagnose and treat issues in animal gut microbiomes. And we even have a researcher in New York State who's studying microbes in fishery. So, like I said, wide, varied, and a lot of fun. So is there any literature demonstrating the Duet system for those interested in the product? Yeah. We have an application note from Jason's lab that I mentioned earlier that they're using the system with E. coli and with common mi the common microbes in the pulmonary microbiome to just demonstrate the effectiveness of the system. We have another application note on that salmonella and intestinal organoid study for people who want to use mammalian cells grown in fluidic contact with microbes. And then we'll have another note coming soon on the bugs as drugs research going on at Duke. And as our academic partners continue running cool experiments with the co-culture system, we'll keep posting application notes. We love sharing the cool stories from our partners. That's very cool. Thank you. So is there anything new on the horizon for the company? Lots new on the horizon for the company. We have a bunch of exciting things coming up. We're in the process of launching an endpoint and kinetic plate reader, the Alto, with an upgraded optical system. And that's coming very soon. And now we're working on a new multi-wavelength plate reader. Our engineers are also working on environmental monitor to help make data analysis and collaboration easier. And as I alluded to earlier, we also have ideas for new formats of the co-culture system. Um, we have one phage researcher who's really eager to get filters with smaller, poor sizes. And some researchers who want larger reservoirs actually don't care about optical density. They want to be able to sample throughout their experiments. One researcher doing transcriptomics in particular. So we have a lot on the hardware side. And then we're also continually adding new analytic tools to our Labrador software. So we're kicking around some ideas for analytical tools to help scientists work with that vastness of microbiome experimental parameter space, potentially using something like AI to help design experiments and analyze and share data. And we have some really cool partnerships going on, one with a leading lab automation company and others with other industry leaders to make our platform even faster and easier to use. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a co-culture champion contest going on where we hope to highlight more cool applications and we'll be giving away a free co-culture research platform. 
And we have a lot of interesting communication platforms in the pipeline, hoping to help scientists communicate and collaborate with each other even more, uh, including a blog and a Discord channel. So keep your eye on our website and across social media, there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the coming weeks and months. Wow, that's really cool. I do want to backtrack a little bit, though. The one thing I saw that was appealing about your plate reader system was it is wireless, and I I work with gut microbiome, or that's been my research for a long time. So you need to use anaerobic chambers, and unfortunately, that involves piping a lot of wires out of the chamber to connect to a computer. So your system is wireless to help uh, make that process easier, right? Yep, absolutely. And that is really what it, those were the customers it was made for with them in mind. Another perk of it is it can connect with five plate readers of five of the stratus or alto plate readers. So you can see all of your data as you collect it in five plate readers together and you can see the data as it's collected. So you can, you don't need to wait for your 16 or 24 hour experiment to be done, you can know immediately if it's working um, and how it looks. But I digress, it was made with research like yours in mind to make research in anaerobic chambers much easier. So before we go, is there anyone you'd like to thank? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for uh, for asking that question. Uh, first off, our technology exists and grows through those partnerships with scientists. And I can't overstate how much we appreciate their support. And I definitely also need to thank the rest of the team at Cirillo. I'm so fortunate that it was me who got to come chat with you today, but we have a really great crew at Cirillo and they're the ones who really make it happen. Um, I think that I learned something from Kevin, our CTO, and Eric, our CEO, Every time I talk to them, our engineers and operations team are fantastic. Our sales guys are the most fun and so supportive. Um, And then we have uh, one guy who's always cranking in the background, our software engineer, Derek, uh, who's an absolute wizard with the software interface and analytics, and he's just getting started. So really a huge shout out to the rest of the team at Cirillo. And Also, thank you so much for having me on today. It's been a lot of fun chatting. Uh, Thank you for coming on. So where can people find either you or more information about Cirillo and its products? Our website is the best place at Cirillo.bio. We're also on Twitter at Cirillo.bio. I guess not Twitter anymore. (laughs) And keep an eye out for our Discord channel. So lots of fun ways to learn more and keep in touch. Fantastic. Sounds great. Thank you again for coming on. Great. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. It's been wonderful.